Okay, so we just got a call for an emergency up in the mountains. A uh, customer called in saying that apparently he left his garage doors open all night. It's been uh, around 2 and 3 degrees Fahrenheit as far as I know all night. Probably even a little colder where he, where he is up in the mountains. Uh, some sub, sub zero temperatures. When I talked to him on the phone, he said he has about 15 feet of pipe. That, 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 that has ruptured from the freezing so who knows how much of the pipe is actually frozen and how much of it is actually damaged I'm just hoping that the whale pressure tank hasn't been damaged or any of the components attached to it certainly I'm hoping that the poly line going to it is not frozen from the whale that would be a, quite the ordeal and not something I normally do as my field of work but We'll see what we can make happen for this guy. Uh, most of the time, these frozen pipe calls, I can take care of it with a hairdryer or two and a small heat, heat gun. Uh, just basically the heat gun to heat the air around the pipe and the hair dryers on the actual pipe itself to gradually warm it up. Uh, sometimes I use my torch too, just to heat the general air and space around the pipes as well a little bit. Uh, but because, this is a large garage, I believe a three car garage, and we have no idea how much of the pipe is frozen. We're just gonna play it safe and pick up what's known as a salamander, which is essentially a large space heater that uses kerosene. So, we'll see what we have once we get there. So we got three split over here. Don't know how much of the pipe is frozen. We've got another free split there. Hope we don't have any split damage on the poly line over there. I don't believe so. Um, we believe that the pump is now turned off in the mechanical room. The water tank's over the other side of the wall, so we should be safe. No damage there, hopefully. And yeah, we'll get it figured out from here. sure you have the pump turned off to the pressure tank as well as the pump to the well system outside uh, usually that's one control box one shut off your best bet is always going to be a hair dryer for small freeze breaks but for such a large space like this and in a garage where it's cold the salamander will be needed um, you can use a more powerful heat gun but generally speaking you, know, you want to use one of these when you're in a large area just trying to heat the open space around the pipe not directly on the pipe same goes for using a torch you just want to do quick glances over the pipe you don't just want to heat one spot um, as the same with the heat gun general heat around the area is also good with that but we're starting to heat up nice and good with this salamander going the other important thing when doing the freeze break is make sure that all the water fixtures in the home are turned on. When this thaws out, if this was a city main for it, for example, it would shoot that ice particle down the line. That can cause issues. So definitely make sure they have all the pipes open. Also with the thermal expansion within the pipes when they're frozen can also cause further damage if nothing is left open inside the home. So we got the four sections of the pipe cleared using the salamander. We still have the hair dryer in the far corner heating that area, but because it's covered, that's doing a pretty good job. Your other tools that are pretty beneficial is an infrared thermometer. These are great if you're in a crawl space or in a trailer to try to find where cold air drafts are coming from. In this case, we're just checking on how the pipe is doing and the heat of it, which we see is 
coming along very nicely on that section. It's just this little section over here that still needs a bit more. Uh, another nice tool for determining where frozen pipe is, is the stethoscope. Put the stethoscope on the pipe, tap it, here it's hollow, especially if you have these free splits and the water's coming out. If there's still ice on the lines by the sound dense, with these free splits the water will flow back and out, so you'll hear if it's hollow with these. What we're going to do here is cut the pipe, we're going to read the term, it's going to be the best spot for it at both ends. Disconnect from the union over there, we do not want to sweat on with a poly line that will melt it and damage it. Once we disconnect the union, we'll cut the pipe, cut the section out, put a Propex adapter on the far end, another Propex adapter over here, and run this all in Wearsbo Propex. Wearsbo Propex, as you know, is an expandable pipe. Being that it's expandable, it's more resistant to free splits. So that's going to be our best course of action here. Alright, so we have the system thawed out. Uh, what we're going to do is break off a union just above where it connects to the poly line coming from the well system. I want to repipe all the way through into the mechanical room with Propex. So I just need two three quarter inch adapters for that. Um, I'm debating whether not to use one of these guys. We'll talk to the customer about that here in a second. Either way, one for the adapter, one more for the other adapter. Uh, we need to use three couplings, six more rings. And then we're going to have a 90 in there, so another two rings. And then if we go with the ball, we're going to have another two rings. on uh, three quarter inch couplings three of those and three quarter inch 90 is in the other tray there we go now do you want to do a dip jig jog around here Not really any need to do that. Okay. Oh, good lord. That one's down for the count. We don't want to leave too much copper behind. That could be a potential freeze. So we'll probably just go for about two and a half or three inches. Come on, get on there. Count. One more ninety. And two more rings. Do you want to have another ball file put in over here? Yeah. 
let's do that cool now like i said the, the fittings are not going to be the same as like the pipe itself the pipe is what's going to be freeze resistant but the fittings not so much mm -hmm. all right now what am i missing yeah that means you didn't put that on there now i mean you're gonna have all this line anyway i don't see the harm in it yeah, okay. and it's like 20 bucks there how are we looking on that back side nice and clean the other way please there we go alrighty Well, it's going to be a dramatic difference between all the parts and labor costs of doing this in copper anyway so apart from all the other benefits it's going to save you quite a bit of cash on this Dream the pipe on this stage. I'm pretty good. Let me see here. Get the little guy on over here. Now, when putting unions together, either new or reconnecting them, it's not a bad idea to put some pipe dope on the treads. Oh, nice. So, the guy that installed this did. Um, Pipe dope, as you know, is a lubricant. But when it comes to the uh, unions, it's just nice to help make sure they don't seize in place. Okay, that's looking good. Excellent. Now we still have standing water in here. It's gonna be a little tricky when we go to sweat. A little bit of half inch Pro Pex is gonna be your best friend in your shop vac. Bit of a 45 degree angle and give her a pre bend before you put it in. Help soften it up, get the right angle. 
and that should slide in relatively nicely. Nope, being a little stubborn, hang on. <laughs> Good lord. Oh well, I'll try to do it the other way. This should give us enough of a vacuum. Let's see. Prepared. I should have three of them in there. The hell? There we go. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Tonight's gonna be one of those days. Give your brass fittings a spin once you put them on, get that flux coat nice and good. Okay. Also, whenever you're doing brass fittings, ensure you have a pair of channel locks at the ready. That way, once you get it nice and liquefied and get all the solder in there, you can give it a spin. Brass, because it's so heat resistant, unlike copper, it's not a good conductor. It's always a great idea to give it a spin. That way, you ensure there's no air pockets inside. I'll tell you what we'll actually do. Let's get this right on center. If you can, try to get as much surface area of the brass as possible. Again, being that uh, it's not copper and not that conductive, you wanna make sure that you spread the heat evenly. A lot of times guys will heat one side, get the flux on, and the flux will spread out, and they think they've got all the way in, but because the heat is not distributed all the way around, it's only gonna be on one spot inside. That should be pretty close to being ready. Lose the grip. And there we go.
so with grass try not to let it just be where the solder gets sucked in you know just put, dropping a bead on one side actually follow it and trace it around There we go. And off you go. Dry rag, never use a wet rag. Micro fractures. Could put a little more heat on one side. Now this flared connection, sorry, <clears throat> this union connection is a flare with a bevel. So before you put them back together, make sure you clean the beveled edges. I need a little gunk of debris in there. Actually, this one I'm going to need to take the sand cloth too. Don't overdo it with the sand cloth. And strip away too much of a layer. Get some better light on it. And then right there. So that's only the face and the bottom. So this used to have a small bit of a leak right there. And then someone came along and tightened it up. So we'll just take that corrosion off. Same on the face. The treads of the union is not what's watertight, it's this beveled edge. So ensure that it's clean. No matter how tight you get those treads, you can still have a leak. And if you try to over tighten them, then you'll break the treads. I should give that a little clean on the inside too, just to remove some of that corrosion. There we go. Alrighty. sit nice Don't counter tighten from the nail end, only tighten from the union itself. If you try to tighten from the nail end, you're putting that beveled edge against the other and spinning it around. That's not the way you're supposed to do it. Hold it nice and steady and just tighten the union nut. There we go. That should be good. Alrighty, so we'll let that cool down before we start messing with the pecs. We'll get the rest of this chopped out. We'll go into the mechanic room, get that sweated up, and then once everything's cooled down, we'll start connecting it back together.
All right, starting on the Where's Bow tool. It's cooled down good enough. Heat is your friend when it comes to these fittings as far as getting them to shrink down nice and well. If you're in an, an empty home or residential unit in the winter time and it's icy cold in there, having your torch with you or a hair dryer if there's an active power source is a good idea as it can take, well it can take a couple of hours if it's freezing cold out for the memory rings to fully contract back into place. Under normal circumstances, room temperature, about 10 to 12 expansions on three quarter inches is all you need. And it should be fully set in about 25 to 40 seconds. So there's that. this around it is going to be better off that way otherwise the handle's going to get too far in the way no matter which way you go about doing it with three quarter inch you need to have at least three inch gap between your fittings that's going to be almost it there. We can cheat the system though. You can do two and a quarter. But if you want to do two and a quarter, you have to expand both rings this at the same time and get them fully set at the same time. Let's get our edge cleaned off. Not quite. There we go. Perfect. Let's take one more little measurement of that. Good right there. The rings are pretty cold from being in the truck overnight. And usually you're faster and better off just to give them one quick half expansion only halfway down your jaws. That way it's easier to get onto the pecs. Doing it this way, you want to do about 14 expansions either side. And once you have that done, stop it right at the full expansion. Give it about five seconds. Then you can click it, go back to the other side, give that a quick expansion. Click it. Then get your fitting on more quickly. And that'll be beautiful right there. Now because we had to hold the expansion open for a moment, you do have to keep it steady in place until it starts to shrink back down. I think the one does have a lopsided fitting that is not gonna be secure. It will hold, it will be watertight. Um, because it's on a well system, the highest PSI you're going to have in a well system is going to be about 65 pounds. In a residential application though, in a, on city line, um, with a PR fee, especially if the PR fee were to fail, you can hit anywhere from 100 to 195 pounds. A uh, half lopsided ring is going to blow off under those pressures. Obviously you want to find out all costs anyway. There we go. Nice. Yep. 
same thing, clean off your ends. Also remember, if the pipe is wet, if the ring is wet, if the tool is wet, if your hand is wet, even just moist, these rings will slip. Ensure everything is bone dry during installation. Okay. That'll be good enough. There we go. Alrighty.
like enamel ears? So let me see here. One and then two. Perfect. So I cleaned up. There we go. Crap. Same for this side. Always make sure when you're joining sides like this. You have plenty of play in the middle where you want to join. A very simple step, but you'd be surprised how many people overlook that detail and have to start all over or put more repair couplings in between. It's not a problem, but you just want to have one solid piece of pipe. Press. Got a nice little backup on our ring. Give that one more expansion because we have to get the angle just right. Place. Just the heat from your hand alone is enough to help speed up this process. And that's almost fully set. Almost. Just keep the angle nice and straight. And there we go. Where's that Sharpie? Come here. valve off. We want to test this section before pressurizing. Now this is the part where we need to be accurate. Just do some rough cuts to get them a little closer in line with one another. See what Y Yang is going to be. Let's take about an inch and three quarters off this one. Meet right in the middle. And then we'll get one ring on one side. We do have more play on the right hand side of this pipe. 
because it's going through that wall over there and hitting the 90 that's going to flex a little bit for us Good. Because this one's so critical, we'll hold it for about half, half a minute just to make sure. Just about all set. I'm just gonna give this last connection a few more minutes to fully compress down, and then we can get the water back on and test each, each section as we go. Side in right now. Good. So we're just getting things repressurized. So if you want to go up and get everything torn off, yeah. Now I'm actually gonna switch this back off here for a second.
Looking good, looking good. That's all the air gone from the filter. We're climbing back up to 40 PSI. Water still running. So. You got all the air out of the lines? Or was, um, or was there still air coming out? Um, it depended. I guess on one of them there was some air coming out and then the other ones were just running seamless. Here you go. Wait, wait. You have this set to 58 pounds. Yeah. Something like that. It just clicked on 58. Um, definitely open up the fixtures until you get all the air out. And the other thing I'll give you a warn. Show me too, but too big of a deal here. But the uh, dishwasher and the washing machine run them with nothing in them mm -hmm. just one cycle whenever you turn off the water like that you're going to loosen up some build, build up in the pipes the plates and stuff not so much unless you're putting like fine glasses in it sure, may scratch okay. them up yeah. but just clothing them more so you don't want any rusty coppery mess on your clothes you know right. um but that's about the only thing I, I could think of to warn you about for now we seem to be doing pretty good Awesome. Uh, I just need to grab a couple of things from the truck just to finish up one or two minor details on the pipes in here. Cool. Actually, I may just be able to make it warp with just the uh, just the insulation. Um, insulation is a bad thing. Yeah. Okay. Blocks out the cold. Also blocks out the heat. Uh -huh. uh, most freeze breaks I see this year. I don't know why. I just I, I didn't get any this year. But all my freeze breaks last winter, yeah, about eight or nine percent of them was insulation. Yeah. <laughs> the insulation that comes for piping systems isn't supposed to keep them from getting cold. It's primarily used for hot pipes so that the water doesn't cool down on the way from the heater to the right, fixture. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as insulating pipes, you want it between the wall and the pipe. It's when people cover over the pipes with insulation, you're just asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me... Oh, damn it. I don't think I have any of that actually. I just reorganized my truck a week or two ago and I think I took it all off and didn't put it back. Let me see, I may have some on this side. Do I? Please? Maybe?
Damn it. I don't. Yeah, they were putting that stuff back on. I had like, oh, there you go. I had like 10 lengths of it. It's been on my truck for years. Never used a single piece of it. So I reorganized, like, let me just take this off. There we go, it's protected there. <laughs> yeah, that thing was just sitting over here. I don't know where that came from, but. How much this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, you see what I was going for though, just to keep it off the concrete. Yeah, right. oh, you're gonna be a git, ain't you? <laughs> 